Well, greetings, and here we are on day Tuesday for another Discipleship Empowerment Word Study. Hope that you're doing well, and we are continuing to keep people in prayer, especially in the country of Myanmar, that we need to be praying for the terrible things that are going on over there, praying for our brothers and sisters, praying for the churches, praying for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Amen. But we are glad that we still have the freedom here to be able to share the Word of God, to be able to talk about the Scriptures. And I, I'm always so excited when we can get into the Scriptures and let the Scriptures get into us. So we're grateful that you've joined us today on our journey as we look at the Word Come. Uh, they were just playing a song on the radio that was titled uh, The Days of Elijah. And of course, in the chorus, it says, Behold, He Comes. And I think that's so neat to have even them singing about the whole idea of coming on the radio before we even get started. So we're glad that we can come together. And may the Lord continue to strengthen us as we gather around His Word. Amen. We're going to start our little bit of a journey today as we are working through the book of John concerning this word come. And we're going to chapter 7, uh, verse 8. And uh, again, as we're in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, we see that a lot of this times that the word come is used is being used by Jesus himself. And so... And he's speaking it in various ways. And again, remember, it's a command. It's part of something that is, is commanding us or challenging us to come. To come to him and he will come to us. And so when we go into chapter 7, verse 8, it says here, You go up to this feast. I am not yet going up to the feast, for my time is yet is not yet fully come. And when I when I looked at this word, even again in reflecting on this morning, where Jesus said, My time is not not yet fully come. It made me to reflect about yes, Christ had come as the Son of Man and the Son of God. But his time had not fully come when it comes to dying on the cross. It was coming closer. It was what to the purpose, why he came was so that he could die on the cross and be resurrected and bring eternal life to all those who would believe. But what I wanted to say here about this particular verse that seemed to, to trigger something in my mind this morning, the importance of timing. You know, God's timing is always right on time. And sometimes we want his timing to come a lot faster and to happen a lot quicker. But in reality, just like Jesus, we have to wait upon the Lord. And at his due time, things will work out and things will come. And I think that's why that they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. Their, their, their strength. They that meditate on the word of God. They shall be like trees planted by the river. I mean, all these things, there is a factor of time. Often we want things to come quickly. We are a fast food uh, service type people. You know, when you drive up to the window through the drive through and you have to sit there for four or five minutes... Um, because something hasn't yet come. That happens a lot for me sometimes. I'm going to say something a little bit funny right now because my wife's going to give me a hard time. But she always orders something on the menu, which is not normally traditional. It's on the menu. Okay. But it seems like whatever she orders comes like five minutes after mine comes. And so we wait, and we wait, and we wait, and we wonder. And I've had times in restaurants where I've eaten my whole entire meal, because I like to eat my meal hot, and hers hasn't come yet. And, uh, you know, so when I was thinking about the timing of coming, you know, we need to be patient. We need to be patient, because in God's timing, it will come. In God's way, it will come. In God's season, 
it will come. You know, it's just like there's a time for planting, there's a time for nurturing, and then there's a time for reaping. And then there's a time for storing. And so what Jesus was telling to tell the people that when he was uh, getting ready to go into back into Jerusalem, he waited for a while, and he also explained to them that his time had not yet come. Then in verse 28 of the same chapter of chapter 7, he then is in at the, the place where they have gathered together, and Jesus cries out this in the temple. And I'm wondering what that would have been like. Where everybody's gathered around the temple, you know, it's a special special weekend as it were, and they're gathering around and then Jesus cries out. I mean, I wonder what he did, you know, whether he said, Hey you guys, listen up, I got something to tell you. Well anyway, the Bible says then Jesus cried out and he taught in the temple saying you both know me and you know where I am from and I have not come of myself but he who sent me is true whom you do not know and so you know he's mingling around the people and people are asking him are you the Christ are you the Messiah are you you know who are you how did you become a rabbi you didn't even go to rabbinical school or anything and you're doing all these miracles and you're doing all this teaching and I guess you know he, he knew what they were in their hearts what they were saying and he cries out to them and says you know I am not come of myself you think he says I have come because I'm trying to fulfill my desires or my will he's saying you've got to get it here people I have come because the Father has sent me to come. I am here not on my own fruition. I am here because he sent me. And you need to get that. But again, he says many of them didn't understand. And because he goes on, he says, I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true. He's talking about the Father. It is true whom you do not know. See, everybody was wrapped up in the religion of the, of the time. But they were not wrapped up in a relationship with God. Because if they were in God, they would then know that God sent Jesus Christ as the Messiah to redeem them, to bring forth righteousness. But they were so busy being religious that they didn't even know that God was right, had come and was right in front of them. Can you imagine that? He's in the temple. And finally he has to cry out with a loud voice and say, People, listen up. My Father, I am here, not under my own fruition, but my Father has sent me. That's why I have come. And <coughs> you don't even know that I'm here. What an astounding thought. How often people don't know that Jesus Christ is in their presence. That Jesus Christ is right there. And all they have to do is call out to him. And they could have full salvation. Full empowerment. Full blessing of the Lord. He's right here. But the religious people didn't even see him. And of course, throughout history, we have had, since the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we've had more religion than we've had walking in faith in Jesus Christ. He goes on in verse 34 of the same chapter. He says, You will seek me and not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. Again, he still Continuing, the religious leaders are bombarding him with all kinds of stuff. And he finally says to him, you know, you're going to seek me, but you're not going to find me. Because you're looking in all the wrong places. You're looking in places that I'm not there. You're looking into all the laws and everything, and I'm not there. Where I am is right in front of you. Where I am is sent by the Father to come to you. 
to show you the way, the truth, and the life. He says, where I am, you cannot come. Because you do not have that relationship, because you've not walked into the presence and come into the abiding presence of Christ, when I go to be with my Father in glory, you cannot come. Because you do not know me, and I don't know you, as Jesus will teach. Then in verse 37, he then talks about the coming of the Holy Spirit. He said, On the last day of the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Out of their hearts. Of course, the verse 39 goes on and talks about the promise of the Holy Spirit. You know, if we come unto Jesus. Jesus has already come. It's like a like a, 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 a artesian well that's standing in, in front of us. And if we would just come to him like that artesian well, you can drink all you want. I don't know if you have ever drank out of an artesian well. I have several times. And if it's been properly filtered through sand, there's some, where I live in Marshan, there is a number of artesian wells. And they're the water that comes out of them. Or if you go up into the uh, Red Rock and up in that area, up into the White Shell, there is wells there that, that water just runs out of the ground. People have just stuck in a pipe in the ground. And you know, if you go over into Myanmar and you travel north of Michina, there is places where pipes are just coming out of the ground. And the water that comes out of there is so refreshing. Well, Jesus is trying to say to him, if anyone thirsts, if anyone thirsts, if anyone thirsts, are you thirsty today? Because if you are thirsty today, he says, let him come to me and drink. Let him come to me and drink. He didn't put a whole bunch of standards or a whole bunch of things in front of that person. He just asked this question. Are you thirsty? Yeah. Are you thirsty for a, a walk with God? Yes. Are you thirsty to come and know Jesus? Yes. Well, then just come and just drink. I know it seems so simple. And people wish they could have all kinds of rules and regulations to obey. Because that's the way people like to be. They like to have a, a scale where they can check things off and say, Well, you know, this week out of, out of ten, I've done six good things. And so I'm now closer to God. Now, what brings you closer to God is just to come to Him. And drink of God. Just come. And drink. That's it. And as you come and drink. You will then begin to experience him. As truth. And. As the way. And as the life. Amen. Because he goes on here in verse 39. He says. But he spoke to us. Concerning the spirit. Whom, which, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. So Jesus was giving a, a prophecy here saying, you come unto me, and as you come unto me, I'm going to give you the living waters. And it's going to change your life. And that's why I think Jesus even talked about it in other portions of scriptures, you know, where he says, if you just drink of the new wine, you won't want the old. I know that was the most revolutionary thing in my life. When Jesus came unto me and I reached out to him because I was destructive, I was throwing my life away. And when I came unto him, he gave me his living waters. He filled me with his Holy Spirit and I've never been the same since. And I pray I'll never be different into the future 
because it's coming under the living waters is what quenches the thirst coming under the living waters is what gives us peace coming under the living waters is what gives us insurance that we know if we were to die today we will be with him in glory that's what the coming is all about amen that's what he wants to do that's what he wants to place within us if you're struggling in some of those areas just come and drink come and drink did you get it come and drink but jesus also warns as he goes later on in john chapter 10 verse 10 he says not only he said you need to be careful not only i have come but i also want to warn you that the thief is also has come that one who wants to destroy that one who wants to divide he is out there roaming around and coming to people to try to deceive them and trick them to get them to turn away from christ jesus said in 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 10 10 of of uh, john he's talking about this whole area of how jesus is the good shepherd but in that whole area it said you know he talks about i am the door and i am the shepherd in verse 9 as he says i am the door if anyone enters by me he shall be saved so there it is if anyone comes to that door and, and it's open and you enter that way you shall be saved and you shall go in and out of fine pastures then in verse 11 he says i am the good shepherd the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep but stuck in between verse 9 about i am the door and verse 11 that i am the good shepherd he gives this warning he says the thief does not come to except to steal and to kill and to destroy but i have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly so jesus is telling the people yes i am the door that you need to go through i am the shepherd that is there to look after you but i want you to know that the thief is also has come and is coming and his role is to steal and to kill to devour to destroy you know i don't know if you understand but the prince of this world is trying you know who is satan is trying to get the people of this world to do his bidding and what is his bidding is to steal to kill and to destroy you know when i look at the country of myanmar i see nothing almost nothing but satan working through the military because why because they're out there stealing they're taking they're just taking whatever they're taking cars they're taking motorcycles they're taking whatever they want they just take it now and they're out there killing and they're killing people for no reason at all just killing people and then not only that they're going around destroying setting homes on fire and all kinds of things so that's why i can say that that army is ruled by the prince of this world satan himself because that's what he wants to do and jesus warns us watch out for that that not only has christ come as living waters not only christ has come as the door that leads into eternal life not only has christ come to be our shepherd to look after us and take care of us but he's also there to protect us and to warn us that there's an enemy out there i don't know why so many disciples in north america i don't know why but so many of them don't believe that we are facing an enemy paul tells us in ephesians you know that there's an enemy out there the rulers of this world all those things and we need to put on the full armor of god and that somehow just seems to go right over the christian's head you know jesus said yeah you come and trust me and have faith in me but there's still an enemy that we have to face did you hear that just because you're a disciple of christ doesn't mean now that the enemy flees away from you no you're still a lamb of god and you know what the enemy still wants to devour you we need to understand that and that so when i say what this is kind of i know 
kind of a little bit of a downer right now, but the enemy is there to come and, and to see that he has come to do what? To steal, to kill, and destroy. But we need to remember that when we come to the shepherd, the shepherd is there to get rid of the wolves, the enemy who try to steal. You know, the wolves don't steal. It's the people, the thieves, the thieves that come in and they steal. And they steal so that they can take them someplace else and then devour them. The wolves, they come in to kill right there, right amongst the body, right amongst the sheepfold. They come to kill. And the enemy also comes to destroy. And this idea is destroying, is to take away, to scatter everything, to, to take away the peace that we can have. But Jesus wants you to know where he says, but I am the good shepherd. You come to me as I have come to you. You know, a lot of sheep are wandering away from the shepherd. And when they wander away, there's all kinds of problems. But the good shepherd is he is willing to give and has given his life for the sheep. So we need to be aware that not only has, has Christ come and, and is standing in front of us, and then when we take him as our personal Savior, is now in us, we also need to stand. remember that there, as Christ has warned us, that we fight against principalities and powers. We have an enemy that we also need to face. But we don't need to face it alone because Jesus Christ has come and has destroyed, has pushed back the gates of hell. Amen. And so then as we go over to John chapter 11, verse 43, uh, this is just the story of La not just the story of Lazarus. This is the story of Lazarus, you know, who has passed away. It was come, and has been in the grave for four days, and and it uses the word come. And, and I'm going to maybe use a little bit more freedom here and spiritualize it a little bit. But I like what it says here in 11:43, where. There's been a discussion about what's going on with Lazarus, Lazarus and what's happening. And then verse 43 he says, Now when he has said these things, he cried out with a loud voice. Let me tell you what he said. Just go back up a verse. It says, And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you, and you have heard me. And I know that you are always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this that they may believe that you sent me. That the Father has sent him to come. And then we get this verse 43. Now when he said these things, he cried out with a, la with a loud voice and said, Lazarus, come forth. And I think sometimes, you know, we are so bound up in grave clothes. People are often in a tomb where the stone has been rolled in front and we think it's all over. But then Jesus shows up and he's always been there. And Jesus comes over and he talks to the people and they're complaining about how long you know Lazarus been there, he'll stink, you know, how if he would have come sooner, Lazarus would have been healed. I mean they were going at Jesus from every angle, blaming him for Lazarus' death. Can you imagine that? But Jesus walks over and says, where have you laid him? Where, where, is he, where has he been buried? Well, over there. So he walks over. And even the disciples said, and he said, roll the stone away. And the disciples even said, no, he's going to stink. You know, this is going to be bad. This is going to be a bad reputation. What happens, you know, you roll the stone away and he's actually dead in there. I mean, what's it going to look for your ministry career, Jesus? <laughs> I'm sure they're thinking of all kinds of things. But Jesus said, you know, he he talks to the father and says father i'm speaking these words but i know you're already there <laughs> and he goes over to the tomb and he says lazarus come on out 
And I think sometimes we don't realize we might feel like we're in a tomb. We're all boxed in. We can't go any place. We can't do anything. But Jesus is there crying with a loud voice. Come on out, James. Come on out, Lauren. Whoever, come on out. And not only come on out, but then he says to the disciples, and I think this is kind of interesting. He says to the disciples, as Lazarus is kind of wiggling his way out from the tomb, he says to the disciples, now you guys go over and loosen him. I mean, there's a lot of thoughts that we could add to this, that not only Jesus calls people out, come on out, come on out from the things of this world. Those of you who are in drugs and alcohol and, and all kinds of gambling and pornography and everything else, let me tell you, if you will just listen a moment, Jesus is calling you to come out from those grave clothes. He's calling you to come away from that death. And if you would just listen to his still small voice, you can and are able to break free from that. Not because of your strength and ability, but because of his strength and ability. It's time to come out. It's time to come out. He is crying. Come on out. Come on out. Come on out. Come on out from that. Come on out from that destruction. But then he's also saying to the disciples, when, when you're come on, coming out, he says to the disciples, now go help him. So we have a role to be able to speak on behalf of Jesus Christ and in the name of Jesus Christ rebuke what the enemy has done, how he has tried to deceive and destroy and to kill. But we are also given authority that as Jesus calls them out unto himself, you know, we need to go over and help disciple them and get their grave clothes off them. Get them into the word and let the word get into them. Amen. Well, it's so wonderful to see what the Lord has been doing and how he has been moving and telling the people, hey, Lazarus, come forth. Then over in John chapter 12, verse 27, we get again where it uses the word instead of came or come, it uses the word came. And Jesus begins to predict about what is taking place in his life. And he says, Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Remember we originally talked today that things were going to happen according to the timing of the Father to the timing of God's will. And now the timing was coming. And then Jesus says, now I want to let you know, this is the reason the why I came. They thought that he had come to set up a new kingdom, to make Israel prominent in the area again. But Jesus now begins to tell them, says, I've come this time as a lamb to lay down my life for you. I come this time to die and shed my, my blood so that I can then become living waters for you. Jesus tells us that's why he came and that's why he's near us today. And if we will have faith to believe, he will come and dine within you and dwell with you amen but the key is let us come to jesus today and if we already have jesus in our hearts let us come to his well let us come to his waters let us come into a deeper fullness of his holy spirit this day amen let's pray father we thank you lord jesus for what you're doing and what you continue to do and I just thank you, Lord, that you're always calling us to come. Help us, O oh Lord, to realize that there's a thief who is out there to destroy, out there that is trying to destroy what you have come to do. He's a liar, he's a thief, and he's a murderer. But Lord, you are the one who speaks the truth. And Lord, you are not stealing, but you are giving. 
and you're not taking life, but you're giving life. And so, Lord, we place ourselves in your hands now this day and gave you thanks for what you're speaking into our hearts about this whole area of coming. And we just come to you and to all your fullness and glory now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. I should just tell you that tomorrow I'm going to be coming to you from the city of Winnipeg. And won't say where, but I'm staying overnight. Tomorrow I'm having a cataract removed from my eye so that I could see you much better. So I will be still teaching tomorrow morning, but from Winnipeg, not only tomorrow morning, but also Thursday morning. And we look forward, <clears throat> I look forward to seeing you even better. <laughs> and Lord willing, if you got a few moments, pray for Colwyn and I and pray for the country of Myanmar. Because we know that Jesus has come and we just need to call out upon him. We love you now. God bless you and Lord willing, we hope to see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.